Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for, for being with us this, this afternoon here in Italy, but in the US should be right a little bit early, of course, but it's gonna be lunchtime. So thank you for uh, spending some time of your day with Moscato Dusty and the Moscato Dusty producers. Uh, my name is Giacomo Pondini. I am the director of Consorzio Asti, Moscato Dasti. And uh, we're going to go through five different wineries today in order to, to understand the meaning of Moscato Dasti and, all the, and develop all the ideas that we have around this wonderful uh, grape. Uh, I'm in charge of the Consorzio since June this year, so I'm quite new, new to, this, to, this, to this job. But I can tell you that Asti and Moscato Dasti have a long story of winemaking, just like everyone else here in Italy, of course, but uh, Asti and Moscato Dasti were the first to be produced as sparkling wine here in Italy in the, the, the 19th century. So there's a long history behind, behind us and the great picture in front of us. The, the consortium was founded in 1932. Ah. There's, a, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot that is going on here in, uh, in Asti and, on, and in the area of production. And a few words on the consortium, because not many people know actually what the consortium is doing. The consortium, the goal of the consortium are, first of all, to promote the appellation, the awareness about of our, uh, of our appellation all over the world. And at the same time, is our goal to guarantee that what goes in the bottle actually respect the code of production of uh, Asti and Moscato Dab. The consortium represents over 200, 4,000 producers of Moscato Bianco grapes that they all are used to produce Asti and Moscato Asti. Uh, there are around 9,700 uh, hectares of vineyards devoted to Moscato uh, for the production of Moscato Asti. And, the, usual, and the, the annual production is around 80 million, 85 million bottles per year. Uh, Asti sparkling wine and Moscato. Mm. And Moscato Dusty. Uh, usually Moscato represents around 30 million bottles and Asti Sparkling represents 50 million bottles per year. I would like now to give uh, to pass over to Jeff Porter. Of course, he's gonna help us going through our appellation today and go deeper with the issues related to, to our wines. So please, Jeff. Oh, thank you, Giacomo. Good uh, morning, afternoon, and uh, buonasera to our friends in Italy. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here in Brooklyn uh, and, and speaking about Moscato de Asti, because I think the majority of us, and I, I'll, I'll venture out on a limb, uh, all of us in the wine industry had uh, uh, Moscato de Asti that kind of, you know, 
the light. I, every time I have a, a sip of Moscato di Asti, it's, it's spring in the glass, summer in the glass, and there's always a smile on my face. And I think that's that's the beauty of of, of these wines. And today, we're have five producers uh, all going to talk about the history, the place, the passion. Uh, and so this is not a top-down discussion. If you have questions, uh, please put them in the, the chat and, and our, our team will register those questions. Um, to a little uh, housekeeping, just so you know, we're gonna go through some of these slides. I'm gonna talk a bit about kind of my experience and, and how I see Moscato di Asti kind of in its place in the, in the wine canon. And then we're gonna have uh, first Luigi Coppa discuss uh, the history of the place because I don't know how deep many of you have gone into Moscato di Asti, but the first record, it shows up in the, the 1100, so like the, the, the 12th century. Uh, to think about that, Moscato Bianco, written down in, in the Long A, in Piemonte, in Asti, in that area. And then uh, Marco from La Cadrina is going to talk about the winemaking process, because this is unique, the Martinelli method. And I think one thing that's so special about the varietal, if you've ever had the opportunity to taste the berry before uh, its harvest, it's one of those grapes that what you taste in the vineyard is almost equally analogous to what's in the bottle. And I think that's so special about these wines. You're literally tasting a time capsule. And then we're gonna get into the, uh, the aromatics. I think the thing that drives us all kind of um, crazy and gets us all so excited is the aroma, is that the, the slight, uh, the frizzante nature of it. And Stefano Chiarlo is gonna talk about that. Uh, one of my dear friends, I love that guy. Uh, and then we're gonna move to, to John Piero and talk about the climate because it's it, Moscato di Asti's even though the, the wine, I think, for a lot of people seems to be this, you know, fun, fruity, fizzy, it's extremely hard to grow. It's very complex. It's a temperamental varietal uh, that if you don't treat it with the love and respect it deserves, you won't get the wine that we're all, we're all accustomed to. So I think a lot of us may take that for granted uh, because of what we preconceive as the notion of the wine. And then finally, we're going to talk about the UNESCO Heritage Site and uh, Andrea from Marenko is going to kind of lead us through that. And so each time when they're speaking, we're also going to talk about their wines within that context. Um, so first off, as you can see here on this page, it's a DOCG. It's, a, it's an area that's, that's controlled. It's one of the most important regions. It's interesting. Um, I found that in the history, and I, I don't know if we're going to talk about this, and, and Luigi, you can speak to it a little bit better. But one thing that I found is in 1511, there was a statute put out by the, the Prince of Savoy that said one fifth of all vineyards in this area had to be planted with Moscato Bianco because if it didn't, you'd get, you'd get fined. And that was how important the, the, the vine was and the varietal was to the region. Uh, as you can see, it's one grape, so Moscato Bianco, very important. It is the, 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 it's the progenitor of all Moscato. So anything that you see down the line is related to Moscato Bianco. Moscato Bianco is kind of the, the big parent of it all. If you've read Ian Degata's book, he has like a thousand pages on Moscato Bianco itself. It's pretty intense. I highly recommend reading it. Uh, there's a lot of great factoids about its, its DNA and its parent and, and how it's the parent of so many others. Uh, as you can see here, and my, 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 I got to adjust my little view of everybody. So you've got one grape. Moscato Bianco, Asti Dolci, Asti Seco, which we'll speak to later, because today's focus is Moscato di Asti. Uh, but I think this is what's, what's the key and most interesting fact about uh, this unique place, is this one, one grape, one territory, and three wines. Um, I think we're going to just jump into it. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. It's so important. You have five of the greatest producers uh, in the region here to answer your questions. So um, if everybody gets their, their Mon Moncalvina in their glass, Luigi, let's talk some history. I have a bunch of notes and some questions for you. And again, if anybody else has questions, please throw it out there. Because in doing my research for this, Luigi, like, and, and, you know, I was there last year and the year before, the, the history for Moscato Bianco region, it goes way further, way farther back than I think most people realize. That's very true. So, <clears throat> hello everybody. My name is Luigi Coppo. I do represent the Coppo Winery. I do represent now the fourth generation. Uh, my winery is located in Canelli and uh, Canelli is a little town in the Asti province which is extremely bounded and related with the Moscato history. 
Before to start with the Moscato history, I would like to start in saying that the Moscato Dusty is the, mo is the most widely consumed sweet wine in the world. Okay, so this, uh, this is already the first uh, very important, uh, uh, for me, information uh, today uh, before to start talking about history. And um, as you already mentioned, actually uh, was given as a denomination of control and guarantee those uh, or origin, so a DOCG, in 1994. Um, and of course, it's uh, it's part of uh, the largest and most diverse family of grape varieties known. So we all know that uh, you have many kind and different Moscato coming from all over the world. But today, we want to talk about Moscato d'Asti. What makes this Moscato unique compared to many other Moscato you can find in the world and, of course, in the market. So the, these three facts. I believe are already enough to know that we are talking about a giant on the international wine scene. Uh, and I'm very proud, of course, uh, of saying that. So you probably, everybody probably know that the Moscato history uh, is particularly rich and uh, very old, as you mentioned. And uh, we can say that the Moscato Bianco was cultivated during the time of the Asian. So, uh, Greeks uh, under the name of Antelicon, uh, Moscaton, uh, while the ancient Romans renamed it in Appiano uh, because uh, of bees. In Italian, uh, uh, bees are called api. And because of the unique, exquisite aromas, all the bees usually goes on top of, of the cluster. And that's why back in the days, the Romans used to call it as Appiano. Then, of course, uh, as you mentioned before, we already we, we have evidences that in the Asti province, the Moscato Bianco, so that's how it was renowned um, and renamed, was already planted uh, back in the uh, 12th centuries, uh, called as Muscatellum. Of course, you have uh, already some, um, uh, how can I say, some, um, some, uh, um, influence of the Latin language in all, uh, in all, uh, in all those names, especially in, uh, in the Middle Ages. What's really important to know is how uh, Moscato became so important in Piemonte. Why, at one point, Moscato has become so much important in Piemonte. A, a visionary man, a great man, Savoy, that at one point stopped all the importation of other varieties in the region and say, this has to be the Moscato that we need to be uh, planted here in the area. And that's, that, that was a sort of turning point uh, because from that time, from that point, the, the, only, the only Moscato that was planted was the Moscato Bianco. So um, I tried to sum up, of course, here centuries of history, okay? So, uh, but I believe those are the, like the key uh, moment in, uh, in, our, in our, of course, um, in our history. I believe then, after that, like in the, the, the 20th century was the century of the uh, how can I say, uh, legal triumph of Moscato d'Asti at one point. Um, uh, of course, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a unique variety in a specific territory. I know then Andrea Marenko later will, talk, uh, will tell us about much more about uh, the territory. But uh, I believe it's um, really important for me uh, trying also to have an overview, not only in the history, but also on the future, you know, and, uh, and what we're realizing that with, uh, you know, with, with, the, with the new millennium, with the new uh, people drinking much more uh, Moscato, uh, thinking about a sort of new fragrant kind of, uh, kind of uh, bubbles. Um, going back to history, of course, uh, um, I believe every uh, winemaker is uh, here today can testify uh, that probably Moscato is the first uh, wine that everybody uh, was started with because of the aromas, because of the low alcohol percentage. Uh, usually it's the sort of the first wine that we have. And uh, it's, it's part of our history, it's part of our uh, DNA. And um, 
I believe it's very interesting also uh, to understand uh, the reason why we, there's, there's so much tradition. Uh, just considering that back in the 19th and the 18th uh, century, as you said, uh, more than one fifth, more than one fifth of the, of the whole hectares that are now counted around 10,000 hectares, uh, more than one fifth of, of those uh, hectares back then were dedicated to Moscato because Moscato was not only the wine that was consumed um, as, a, as a dessert wine, but in, for, for some family it was a sort of everyday wine. That's, that's, that's amazing. I mean, I think, and if, again, please, if you have questions, please put it in the chat uh, or raise your hand and Anna will uh, we'll get to it. So Luigi, with, with, um, with that history, and, and I think one thing to note here, the last slide said it, you know, in 1932 is when the, the consortio began. It was two years before Barolo. Can mm -hmm. speak to why, why in that, that time was, was Moscato di Asti, in, in the area of Asti, kind of the power economic player in, in Piemonte? Well, you know, it's, it was basically it was Asti as a, as a province and Canelli as well as a marketplace. Canelli was really known uh, as, a, as a place of um, um, market. So it, it was a, a, there was a big scene in terms of, uh, of um, uh, people coming, buying wine and grapes. And, um, and as you said, it was a sort of the, uh, the real economic uh, power back in the 30s was uh, around this variety, around this, uh, uh, these grapes. Um, I would say probably then, you know, um, later, uh, Asti became more, um, um, how can I say, um, related with the Asti Spumante and then Canelli itself uh, with, uh, with other um, villages around as Santo Stefano, as Calamandrana, as Strevi, for instance, also, you know, and we have one of the, uh, the best producers here, which is Marenko, coming from that area, which is slightly different but still, you know, uh, became to be much more related with what we say tapporazo, you know, which is the Moscato d'Asti, the traditional one, what we are tasting uh, today. Tapporazo. That's a, that's tapporazo, a, which means cork finished. I like that. That's a new word for everybody. So the, you, you, you lead us perfectly into that saying, you know, Copos from Canelli, that's where your, your grapes are grown. So can, we, can you lead us through... Uh, your Moscato di Asti, so... Yeah, sure. So, my Mos uh, what we're tasting, the name of the Moscato, it's called Moncalvina, named after a, what's it's called, a Cascina, that we own here in Canelli. So, it's a, um, a country, uh, countryside house uh, in uh, Sant'Antonio, which is one of the fraction of uh, Canelli, which is a higher uh, elevation uh, compared to the, to the village. So, my wine is located in the village, and... Um, and that's again, it's a sign of history because, uh, uh, as you mentioned before, Canelli was known to be as a, a big, very important business uh, uh, marketplace. So all our uh, actors, all our properties are around Canelli and uh, our Moncalvina is made out from a, a specific area in Canelli, which is called Sant'Antonio, which has a higher elevation. We are talking about 300 meters of, uh, above, the, above the sea level. It's a, a, a south exposed. Um, it's a south exposed vineyard. Uh, it's a beautiful crest. In the north side, we have the Pinot Noir because we also make sparkling wine. And in the south, facing a part of the vineyard, it's dedicated uh, to Moscato. Uh, the vintage we are all tasting is 2019. Um, in my uh, specific uh, case, I mean, the winery was founded by my great grandfather back in 1892. And since then, we've always been uh, making. Uh, uh, Muscat. Um, I think that what we are looking for, uh, you know, while you're tasting the Moscato, what we're looking for in, lately in the last uh, uh, years, also because, and Stefano will tell us more about the climates changing so fast, what we're looking for in our Moscato is try to have the right acidity in order to balance the sweetness that Moscato naturally has. So we rather have to have, uh, uh, you know, a little uh, more acidity uh, at the first place in order to keep this balance, in order to keep the freshness. So what I'm looking uh, in my Moscato, usually, of course, it's fruitness, but also it's those kind of notes that are minty, sage, uh, pear, 
uh, you know, something that gives more uh, freshness. And I hope that uh, you can feel it in the class. I mean, I, I, I absolutely can. I think hopefully everybody's there trying the wine. The, the thing that I think, again, what's super cool about this tasting is I don't know how many people have tasted five Moscato di Asti right. side by side. I think a lot of people too are also like, oh, Moscato di Asti is Moscato di Asti. And I think through this no. tasting, Consortio, we're now going to see this uniqueness play out because aspect, altitude, soil, different concentrations, different times of picking, it all plays into it. And even though there's a through line of that fruitiness in each of the five wines, there's, there's a unique, I think, how would you specifically characterize Canelli? Is it that more mint herbal note that comes? I would say yes. I would say yes. Yes. Uh, and I think you will realize during the tasting. I think uh, there's always uh, some more herbal, uh, minty kind of style, um, kind of notes that are very characterized from uh, that side of Canelli, because believe it or not, so just to give you some information, you know, and for everybody's online. So if you're looking or Google at um, a great book, which is Stucchi, you will, you will see, you will see that is, this is one of the greatest book talking about Moscato. And you can literally see that over a hundred years ago, he was really uh, accomplished uh, a sort of uh, map zone. Antonio was known as a sort of a. It's a. It's a. It's, it's a big. It's a, it's a big word calling out as a crew, but actually it was. It was. It was pointing out that area as one of the most important uh, in Canelli, and usually. Uh, the kind of Moscato you get out of that area is the kind of minty, sage, herbal style of Moscato, which is slightly different from many other Moscato. But Jeff, you, I think you, you touched the, the most important feature today. Uh, Moscato Dust is a serious wine. So why you can taste five different Moscato, one side by side, you, I think people can really understand. And thank you very much, of course, the consortium to put this together, Giancarlo Vollino and everybody, because it's a, such an honor and a great opportunity for us to be here today. Well, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Luigi. Actually, we have a couple of questions for Luigi. So Lynn yeah. Farmer is saying um, that your winery is uh, very close to one of the best restaurants in the entire region, San Marco. How important are these restaurants in promoting Moscato Lasti? Very much, very much. I mean, they're, they're, they're their first, our first ambassadors, of course. They're very important. They are extremely, um, it, it's very important that they can uh, pour and serve some Moscato Dasti because people are coming to Piemonte um, also uh, because we have a very long tradition in food and, and of course in wine as well, but also in food. And uh, it's very important for us to be represented in such important restaurants as San Marco was mentioned. It's one of the best, of course, in the area, very true. And it's very important. Wonderful, thank you. And we also have a couple of questions about the pairings, in particular with the Moncalvina. Yes, so, uh, well, you know, um, of course, Moscato is known to be as a dessert wine, of course. So I would say dessert, of, it's very obvious and easy. But I would like to say, try to think out of the box, not thinking only as Moscato as a dessert wine, try to think as a Moscato as a sparkling wine. Try to think as a Moscato with that, uh, again, because of the natural sweetness, it's not a cloning kind of uh, wine. It's a, a Moscato, when it's well made, has some acidity. So it's a balanced wine. Try to have it with some charcuterie, try to have some Moscato with some blue cheese, try to have Moscato with, with foie gras, try to have Moscato with uh, spicy shrimps. Um, you'll be surprised how versatile Moscato could be. Perfect, thank you. Awesome, so th that, that leads You're us welcome. into the, the winemaking wine -making process. And you know, everybody's gonna be talking, I'm gonna go through these slides so you can see it and find any questions. But one thing I wanna post to the group is, Maybe in the comments, and I think the producers would really appreciate this, maybe write down your kind of your first remembered experience with Moscato di Asti, because I feel that so many of us in the industry, it's one of those first wines where we have a, a fun, a pretty story. And I know for me that when I started my first wine job, I was 21 years old. I worked at a wine shop in Austin, Texas called Central Market. And the first time I had a Moscato di Asti, my, I, I literally, my mind was blown. I was like, what, what in the world could be 
truly a, 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 a wine that, that transmits this, it's a feeling. It's, I, th I find the wines very visceral. There's an emotional quality to the wines that I think is a lot of fun. And then going back to what you said, Luigi, with food and wine pairing, it's not just cakes, cookies, and, and, and fruity desserts. My very first real experience with it was a hot summer in Austin, Texas, bringing this to a picnic and being refreshed and watching everybody else sweat and then pouring this around and everybody losing their, uh, their mind while we were having spicy barbecue ribs. So uh, it's, it's not just for uh, cookies. So think about that, put those stories out there because I know the producers would love to hear that. So th that brings us to Marco Dolioti. Uh, I think La Cadrina is, is if, if, if you're not familiar with it, I'm glad you have it in your, in your glass now. He's a, an amazing uh, viticulturalist, a amazing winemaker. And I, I've, I've been a big fan of his wine since I was in California. So thank you, Marco. He's gonna talk about the, the vinification because it's again, a unique process. Uh, so Marco. Sì, ehm, allora, prima di tutto, eh, grazie a tutti voi di essere qui. Thank you, Thank you everyone for joining. Io eh, ringrazio anche il direttore che mi dà una mano a tradurre l'inglese, perché mi inglese come i miei capelli ce ne sono pochi, quindi... Just like, eh, my, just like my head, you don't see many hairs, that means that my tongue doesn't speak any, any English, so I will, I will have to go through, he said, uh, the help of uh, Giacomo, so I'm here also to translate. Eh, sì, io sono Marco eh, e sono un figlio di Romano Dogliotti. Actually, I'm one of the brothers, uh, one of the three sons of Romano Dogliotti, the owner and the, 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 actually the producer that is written on the label. Eh, allora, eh, la, la vinificazione. Eh, la vinificazione, diciamo che eh, ogni produttore eh, parte nel momento in cui lui crede che l'uva sia pronta. The vinification starts at the moment when every single uh, winemaker, wine, wineries decide to pick the grapes. So everyone has its own decision to make first when to pick the grapes at the right moment. Quindi quando si ha un buon tenore zuccherino e una, una buona acidità. So a good acidity balanced by a good quantity of sugarness in the grape. Le vendemmie, la vendemmia viene fatta uh, uh, principalmente a mano, manuale. E, la, e una volta che le uve arrivano in, 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 nella cantina vengono pressate sofficemente. Grapes are quickly uh, hand picked, then softly pressed at the winery. Una volta pressata il, il mosto eh, si, si rende limpido eh, grazie a una chiarifica e poi viene tenuto freddo. Once, once the must is created, then it has to be clarified and then it's brought down to below zero in order to, to freeze the must for a certain period. Uh, in questo, uh, successivamente, quando uh, si ha il mosto uh, limpido, lo si tiene freddo a circa uh, zero meno due gradi e pulito, quindi uh, bello filtrato, bello limpido. Um, più o meno gli ho detto questa cosa qui quanto uh, tempo rimane uh, uh, allora uh, il, diciamo che il, il mosto rimane tale fino a quando uh, non, uh, non, si, non si fa la prima fermentazione the most remain frozen as long as the winemaker doesn't decide does not decide to start the, um, the alcohol fermentation quindi in caso di necessità ecco mm. uh, Si, una volta eh, messi i lieviti all'interno del, del mosto e il mosto portato a 24-25 gradi. The must is then inoculated with yeast and then brought to 24-25 degrees. Eh, e viene fermata la fermentazione quando raggiunge i 5 gradi di alcol. And then the fermentation is stopped when it reaches 5% uh, alcohol. Perché per, um, per legislazione, per essere uh, chiamato moscato d'asti, deve avere un minimo di 4 gradi e mezzo e un massimo di 6 gradi di alcol. In fact, in order to be moscato d'asti, the alcohol percentage has to be between 4.5 and 6%. Uh, mentre invece la, la pressione del, del vino, quindi la bollicina, uh, viene tenuta a circa 2 atmosfere e mezzo di pressione, che è il massimo per, per quanto riguarda la denominazione. 
while the pressure has to stay uh, on the 2.5 bar. Uh, mentre invece, piccola parentesi, per quanto riguarda invece elasti, si va dai, uh, dai, dai, dai 7% di alcol fino a un massimo di 9, uh, mentre invece la, la pressione un minimo è 3 atmosfere. While just to give you a comparison, Asti sparkling uh, has to be between 6 and 8% uh, percent of alcohol and uh, 3.5 minimum pressure, uh, minimum pressure. A questo punto, uh, quando abbiamo il vino che ha raggiunto la, la gradazione uh, desiderata. desiderata, si ferma la fermentazione con, uh, con il freddo o a macchina e si filtra. Once the wine has reached, uh, once the fermentation has given this 5% uh, of alcohol, then the fermentation is stopped with a, uh, with a cooling process and then the wine is filtered. Una volta uh, che abbiamo il, uh, il vino pronto uh, per essere imbottigliato, viene chiesto uh, l'idoneità all'imbottigliamento. Uh, all Quindi si chiede il parere della DOCG. And when, when the producer uh, thinks that the wine is ready to be released on the market, it has to go through the uh, panel of experts that sits in specific um, agencies here. So it, it, the winery sends the samples and if they are considered to be uh, okay for the market, then the wine is released, can be released. And of course, it's important to have the DOCG label on the neck of the bottle before being on the market, before being on the shelves or in restaurants. Uh, uh, that's all. Uh, questo è tutto per quanto riguarda la finita vinificazione, ecco. That's pretty much all in terms of vinification and winemaking process. So I, my first question uh, to Marco Giacomo is, you know, how, how they hold the, the wine throughout the, the year and, and they, they um, based, upon or, based upon orders, how often, how many times a year do they go through the fermentation process with the, the, that one harvest? In general, I know it's depend on. Uh, di dipende dalla, dalla richiesta. Magari sotto il periodo di natalizi avviene uh, due o tre volte al mese. Ecco. It depends much on the request from the market. Usually, for example, during the, when it starts winter time, during Christmas time, it happens quite often. Of course, there's a lot of requests about this one in, this, in that period of the year. So maybe it can happen twice or three times during during December, January. Anche perché il, il mosto è, è più facile um, da, da, gestire. Da, da gestire in cantina e, um, ed è, se si tiene mosto uh, praticamente non invecchia. Once the, the must is frozen, it doesn't get old at all. So you can, it really maintains the freshness and the fragrance of the, of the Moscato grape. So it, it's, it's, really, it's really a technical advantage to keep it frozen because it gives the same freshness at the moment that it goes in the bottle that it also had at the moment of the first vinification. E poi si fa anche questo per riuscire a mantenere sempre un livello di freschezza sul mercato mm -hmm. del prodotto che è importante. And, and the most important part is, is that we have to give the freshest pr product on the market that we are capable to give. So what, what we give in the on the market, what we release on the market, it always has to be fresh. Anche se comunque è, è un prodotto che può... Well, può even, even, if the, if, even if the... If, even if you, the vintage is back, maybe it's older than six or eight months. That's, I mean, I, I think that's a, a strong advantage for the region to have that ability. Anna, are there any um, questions yeah. about modification? Sorry, we actually do have a couple of questions. So Lynn says um, that we have a lot of boundaries for Moscato Lasti, like the alcohol, the pressure, the residual sugar, and then acidity to balance. These depend on a certain consistency in growing conditions, but with the climate change, is it difficult to keep the grapes from getting too ripe to meet the requirements? Allora diciamo che se le, facendo più caldo le, le uve maturano prima quindi si risolve il problema uh, 
andando ad anticipare la, la, quello che è il periodo di vendetta. Usually with this climate change, the, the, the grapes mature earlier than usual, so we solve the problem by picking them earlier than usual. So it, once, maybe 10 years ago, the, the harvest could start in the second half of September, now it's starting in late August. So it's something that we are still uh, capable to, to face somehow. Uh, the other question in order uh, of the, all the limits that, that we have to follow, those limits are given by the code of production that actually was written by the same producer. So it's something that they, they feel like they have to follow in order to produce a quality wine. I don't know if I got it right, the question, but I think probably that was the question. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, Cindy wants to see um, our... Are those in the region picking earlier than usual? So you okay. said... Go ahead. Uh, sì, diciamo di sì. Uh, il, il periodo, uh, diciamo che il, il periodo storico era attorno ai dieci, uh, primi dieci giorni di settembre. Adesso siamo, uh, c'è qualcuno, ad esempio per cui ci ha già incominciato a vendere già circa una settimana fa, uh, and noi per quanto mi riguarda incominceremo questa settimana. Uh, there are wineries that already started the, the picking about four or five days ago, while this winery, this winery is going to start in two, three days, so in, the, in this week. Uh, but as I said, usually, historically speaking, has always been a question of starting after the 15th of September, usually. That was the, the typical period to start the, the, the harvest. And I, I think that, that leads us into to tasting the, the La Cadrina. So if everybody hasn't tried it already, this is the, the label. Um, you know, Marco, could you speak? So we, we just tried a wine from Canelli with the, the Copo wine. Now we're in Castiglione Tinella. And you said, you know, you're picking a little later than other, other regions. And automatically you can feel texturally the difference. The fruit component is different. Could you speak to, to what you feel is the, the, the flavor profile of, of your area? Sì, allora, eh, noi abbiamo un eh, sentori principalmente eh, floreali eh, che portano a sentori di frutta, quindi mh, una, una fragola, una pesca, ecco. Eh, la... Vai. Usually the, 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 the profile is, starts with a strong relation with flowers, but usually it also end, ends up with uh, uh, strawberry or peach. In, that's in the, in the idea of Marco. And um, that's pretty much the, the center of the fruitness that of this wine, of the texture of this wine comes to have this specific profile and feel. The acidity is very pleasurable, anche perché comunque la, è, è molto importante, come mi spiegava, uh, Luigi, l'acidità su un vino dolce, su, su un moscato è importantissima perché eh, eh, ti aiuta ad avere una, eh, una piacevolezza del vino che eh, a, dalle altre parti del mondo ci invidiano. Ecco. Just like Luigi said, it's uh, central, central to this wine, to, to all our wines, to have a a strong acidic profile in order to, to give the right balance to the strong, uh, to the sweetness that otherwise would, would make the wine uh, a little bit too, uh, too boring in order to maintain the freshness and the, and the, and the will to go on with the drinking. The acidity is of course the, 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 main, the, main, the main target that we have to follow while we're um, in the wine making process. I don't think any of us lack the will to, to, to stop drinking. We, we, we as a unit have much of that. Um, thank you, Marco. Grazie, Marco. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to move to our next, and, and as again, going to uh, Stefano Chiaro is going to, I think, speak to, to kind of the root of Moscato Nasty, that when we, when we open the bottle, Stefano's wine, I think this probably was the very first Moscato di Asti I had of the uh, Nivole. Uh, about Hi, Jeff. Hi. I think there's something going on with your microphone. 
Is it like an echo? There was like a little, a little echo. Okay. Jeff? Go for it, Stefano. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jeff. Uh, thank you to everybody. And uh, um, my part is to to explain a little bit the, the aromatic part of Moscato Dusty. Moscato Dusty is very well known for the attractivity of the flavor of the aromatic part because there are a richness unique in the world of monoterpene. Monoterpene that have uh, uh, the scientific name in linaloro, uh, uh, geraniolo, and the andiolo. These uh, are three, the most important monoterpene that give the unicity to the Moscato Dusty. Uh, especially for three main reasons. For the uh, composition of the soil, the, the soil here is very rich of white sandy soil. The conformation of the hillside is not a flat uh, terroir. Uh, the microclimate, uh, because uh, you know we have a continental microclimate, but we have uh, the end of the summer that are uh, warm day and cool night, and also is exalting for the the winemaking uh, natural fermentation style. Uh, especially the Lina Loro, uh, Lina Loro give this kind of uh, unicity to the Moscato Dusty especially the sage, the musk, the apricot, the white peaches. This kind of flavor are really the most, uh, in terms of quantity, uh, um, uh, aromatic part in all the Moscato of the world, in the Moscato dust. And uh, is a sign of the Moscato dust. Uh, what, uh, um, uh, what do you tell before, also what uh, Luigi tell before, uh, like a winemaker, is that uh, I consider Moscato Dust a really serious wine and probably the most difficult wine to produce. Consider that uh, uh, a lot of, of us uh, producers are producer of also of uh, important red wine, like Barolo, Barbaresco, or Barbera. Uh, and uh, we have the same mentality in, in the vineyard, in the winery, with the production of Moscato Dusty. And uh, for this reason, but also it's very difficult wine to produce because like uh, you told before, uh, is, uh, you need a lot of experience in the vineyard for uh, have the right timing to pick up the grapes and a lot of attention in the winery for have this kind of uh, uh, perfect balance between the sugar, the sweet, and the small bubbling, especially the, the end of a, a nice acidity that clean the mouth at the end. For this reason that, for my opinion, Moscato Dusty is only is one of the few uh, sweet wine that have a, a lot of su success in the world, especially in the last 15, 20 years. The, all the, the dessert wine, they don't have a big success because Generally speaking, there are a lot of sweet, they don't have acidity, and they are very heavy wine. And for my opinion, Moscato Dusty is like uh, uh, have a sorbet of uh, wine dessert, uh, of wine, uh, and give the opportunity to drink uh, in different occasions with different food. Uh, in our case, uh, Nivore uh, uh, has arrived from the territory of uh, uh, Canary and uh, the village neighbor uh, uh, close to Canary. Uh, respect uh, um, uh, the Luigi Moscato d'Asti Moncalvina is not a single vineyard uh, uh, located in the height uh, uh, position of Canary, but there are different uh, vineyards, uh, part in Canary, part in Calamandrana, part in San Marzano. And uh, what we are looking for in, the, in the, our style of Moscato Dusty, especially in Nivole, uh, and the profile is to have a, 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 um, a good mix between the, the different places that arrive uh, the grapes. So uh, we can have the, 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 the most uh, um, flower expression uh, for, the, for Canary uh, and some more fruity expression for a little lower uh, hillside, especially in San Marzano and Calamandrana. So they give more uh, richness of uh, uh, peaches, apricot, 
uh, and, and also SAID. Uh, we, we, all the, the five family uh, in our tradition, we begin uh, more than 40 years ago to produce Moscato and uh, Moscato Dusty. And uh, we are really proud, uh, especially when uh, we offer to test uh, for the first time to the, in the wine testing uh, to the people that usually don't, uh, don't believe the sweet wine could be something of a real different wine. And so for this reason that for the wine, Piemont winemaker that uh, generally speaking, the people think are, they are red wine winemaker. We are very proud uh, to, to, to produce Moscato Dust. I, I think that's me. And I think, um, Stefano, it's, it's important. I'm gonna just uh, reiterate that when, you, when you're in, in, the, in the area, and you meet a producer who makes Moscato Dusty, uh, be it if they're in the if they're in uh, the Lange or if they're in Asti or then Alessandria, they're so proud of it and they talk about the difficulty of it, the 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 challenge. And I find that when when you when you have a wine that transmits truly the the flavor of the place and the grape and the wine tastes so similar, one misbalance, it's, you could blow everything up because if you're out of balance in this, it, it won't it won't hit and that that right there it's. I feel like making Moscato di Asti is threading a needle, trying to be very, very precise. Thank you very much. Uh, and especially we have now 2019, a perfect climate for um, a top vintage. And uh, what is really um, interesting in, is to see also the evolution of this wine. Uh, sometimes we have open uh, vintage that are uh, seven, eight years from the harvest, they are a little less in terms of, uh, uh, in term of um, uh, florality, but more in terms of minerality, close to some uh, raising, raising profile. And uh, uh, we are also surprised sometimes that, uh, but also the, uh, what is really interesting to see is, uh, the evolution of these wine that are uh, really nice and probably uh, step by step become more gastronomical wine after four or five or six years. I think that's that's amazing. I wanted to give everybody, I felt this map was a really good way to kind of, uh, you know, this, this is the area, there are 51 villages that, that make up uh, uh, the DOCG and here you is, as we said, it started in 1932 and in 67, they added this small part over here here that's in the the Lange, the Barbaresco area uh, but again you can see what the producers are you know different altitude different soil type different expression they're picking a few days apart that can make the difference in the textural the 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 different fruit the herbal quality and again I think as we've tried to rewind so far each of them are distinct and I think for for retail shop and or wine shop that distinction is unique because you can you can go to someone and say, you know, oh, do you like this style or this style? Because I feel like a lot of restaurants and or, and I, I've been guilty of this in the past, where I just have one Moscato di Asti, and that's not fair to the region and the producers because they are different. And I think that's extremely unique and important to realize. Um, you know, this gives you kind of a, we're, we're pulling back now. As you can see, you've got the, the Maritime Alps in the bottom. And we're going to talk about the, the climate right now with, with John Piero. Um, I think this is another unique. Could you to the producers real quick just say kind of what altitude they average at with their vineyard? We can go from 200 to 600. So we'll start with you, Luigi. Where, where do you average out in your, your vineyard? 280 from, from 280 to 300, more or less. And Marco? Marco around 300. 300, yeah. And Stefano? They are different altitude for, because they are dif uh, different vi uh, vineyards. Yeah. And then uh, Giampiero, where, where does your, your vineyards average out at? Um, I'm sorry, I'm translating very quickly. Uh, Quanto è il dislivello del mare? 250 uh, over the sea, sea level. And then Andrea. Yeah, we also, as Stefano said, we have different uh, altitudes, but the average is on 300, but we go from 250 to 400. This is, this is kind of my segue into to what we're talking about with Giampiero. Giampiero from, uh, from Ivanioli di uh, Santo Stefano, 
is going to talk about the climate. And as you can see on this slide, you know, the Western Hills are higher, so there's a cooler, uh, a cooler temperature. And now everybody's got to play around with what's going on with, with, uh, with climate change. Um, and I think with this, again, this varietal we're, we're hitting on, it, it's such a translator of the moment and of the terroir that you, you have to kind of nail it and thread the needle. Um, so our next wine comes in the long, I always called this the rocket ship when I worked in, in, in the rest. Uh, I love, this is a, again, another kind of iconic Moscato di Asti in the market. Um, but again, I think a lot of, a lot of us have questions about what's going on with the climate. I think many of the producers themselves are like, what the hell's going on with the climate? Uh, cause it seems to change by the moment. Uh, so John Pierre, if you can talk about the climate of the region as a whole, then we can kind of discuss uh, climate. Thank you to be here today and thank you for your, uh, to enjoy this, uh, this call with you guys today. Sono Gian Piero Scavino e vi parlo dell'azienda dell Vignaioli di Santo Stefano. I'm Gian Piero Scavino, I'm talking about uh, uh, my company which is Vignaioli Santo Stefano. Che a differenza delle altre realtà è una società formata da due famiglie, la mia con mio fratello eh, e la famiglia Cerello. It's a winery owned by two families, established in 1976, and is owned by Gian Piero and uh, my, my brother Andrea, and uh, uh, as well as uh, the Ceretto family. Il, um, la zona di produzione del Moscato è una zona particolarmente grande. Uh, in Piemonte occupa 51 comuni. The Moscato area is quite big. Uh, it's, uh, it counts now 51 uh, uh, town. In 52 comuni abbiamo dei microclimi particolari differenti. And, uh, in the old town that uh, we follow, we have a different uh, microclimate. Negli ultimi anni il, le temperature, soprattutto estive, sembra uh, salgano. Uh, Quasi continuamente. Especially in summertime, the, in the last past uh, few, uh, few years, uh, the climate in the summertime is, uh, is more uh, warm. E anche gli inverni uh, tendenzialmente non hanno più quel, quella quantità di neve che un tempo creava un, un, un particolare periodo freddo e quindi assistiamo sempre di più a vendemmie anticipate. And also in uh, the winter time is not so long as uh, many, many years ago, last 10 years ago, but winter are uh, less longer. And uh, that's, why, uh, that's why every year we have to anticipate uh, the harvest. Quindi, come è già stato detto, nel, nelle ultime, per esempio, dieci annate, almeno la metà hanno visto l'inizio della vendemmia uh, negli ultimi giorni di agosto o comunque i primi di settembre, Mentre un tempo era molto più facile vedere l'inizio della vendemmia dopo il 15 di settembre. Yes, in the last past 10 years, uh, our harvest in Moscato is, uh, uh, came uh, by the end of August, uh, before it was at the beginning of September. That's because of the warm uh, temperature that uh, we are continuing to see. Poi, come dicevo prima, la zona di produzione è particolarmente grande e quindi si vengono a creare all'interno della zona all'interno delle varie colline e all'interno delle varie pendenze delle situazioni particolari. Yes, so the, the maps, the territory of Asti, Moscato d'Asti, uh, territory is quite big, as I said before, it's 51 little town, uh, in between uh, Asti, Alessandria and Cuneo uh, province, and uh, for this uh, we have a different uh, microclimate. Ed è per questo che è facile vedere anche all'interno di noi produttori diverse epoche di, di raccolta. Nel, nel, per per fare un, un esempio pratico, noi ad esempio abbiamo iniziato la scorsa settimana con le raccolte perché avevamo delle posizioni che avevano necessità di essere, di essere tolte. In my case, uh, where uh, my vineyards are situated, uh, we start uh, last, uh, um, last week. This because we, our position is quite high. The slope of the hills is 25% to 40% of slopes. So the, the grape is more ripe than other places. 
eh, qui c'è quindi è, è particolarmente diversificato il clima all'interno di questa zona eh, che è come dicevamo una zona importante eh, per quanto riguarda quello che è la qualità delle uve che, che vengono fuori yes so this uh, this is a very important uh, point uh, also Um, for example, we focus also in, in the months of August where the temperature range is changing a lot in between uh, night and day. So this, uh, um, this helps uh, to uh, an exaltation of the purity of aromas typical of Moscato dusty. Okay. Are, are there any questions, Anna, regarding the, the climate? Uh, no, I'm not regarding the climate, no. Perfect. So if, if uh, John Pierre, if you'd like to speak specifically on, on your wine and, and what kind of separates it, sorry, from, um, you know, the, the other five that we're tasting. And, and, you know, I can see also on, on the back, you have the, the EU green certificate. If, maybe you'd like to speak a bit about the biologic farming in, in the region itself. Vuoi parlare della parte... Ho scelto di ehm, produrre un moscato bio, eh, è una scelta fatta oramai sei anni fa eh, ed è anche per, per questa motivazione che le uve hanno avuto un, eh, un incremento di maturazione dovuto al, um, al particolare eh, sviluppo del, della maturazione dei, dei vigneti. Quindi il, um, il, il vigneto risponde in modo molto più rapido per quanto riguarda le maturazioni. We start to produce bio six years ago and uh, we, we follow that uh, uh, in this case uh, the grape is much more uh, ripe than, uh, than other places. Uh, this because we don't use uh, any pesticide so that means uh, we have the, the grape more ripe than other places. Excellent. Now, I, I think, uh, thank you very, very much, uh, John Piero. I, I think that's the, obviously, across the world, it's the most uh, the striking thing that's affecting all the growers across the world. Uh, it's interesting because you, you go from a, a period like 19, and before that, 17 was so dry and hot, and you have this kind of up and down. Do you find that, that the quick change of, of climate uh, extremely difficult to manage year to year, or do you just approach it Singularly, this is this year, that was that, that year. She's translating. Il, um, il cambiamento climatico è oramai una, credo sia una costante, quindi una cosa da tenere in considerazione sempre di più. Eh, la valutazione dell'uomo è quella che fa, fa la differenza, quindi l'essere presenti in vigna, il controllare durante il periodo estivo l'evoluzione dell'uva dell è la base su cui lavorare. Poi ci sarà anche la degustazione del, della bacca, la, 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 la campionatura delle uve a livello analitico, ma la visione dell'uomo, quello che vede la persona sui propri vigneti, secondo me è ancora fondamentale. Now, about talking about climate, um, he's saying that now the changes of climate is, uh, um, is a rule. So that's why uh, we follow day by day uh, the, the grow of the grapes. So it's, um, it's something that we have to, to, to deal with. So that's why we have to, to, to take care uh, from January to uh, to the harvest um, in the vineyards. Well, thank you very, very much. Uh, Anna, are, are there any questions? Yeah, we have um, a question about the favorite vintage of his production. Which, uh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, Is for me, 19, uh, um, 17, 19, and uh, 11 was the, the three most important vintage for our ah, I like 2016. 16, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
and next thing. Uh, Jean Pierre, you say 2003. 2003, okay. 2003 or 2012. So I agree. 16. 16. So it's, okay. it's, it's 16 common. is common. You kind of stand out because, like, 03, 12, 11, 17, all pretty warm vintages. And, and Luigi, you pick kind of more of a, a cool. Uh, vintage. But could you pick them all across? It's, it's interesting that, you know, 03 are very, very warm. So do you feel that in hot days, the, the varietals really, you know, shine? Or, or Luigi, I'd be curious to see the, your, your take on, on why picking a, a more classic cool vintage. I believe in the hot uh, vintage, you have more creamy sensation. But if you are... Um, uh, uh, man of the vineyard and to, and to pay attention in every parcel to pick up the grapes when you have the perfect acidity you are you have a, you are much more intense of flavor much more richness of the wine but uh, depend of the philosophy if you prefer more light moscato you prefer the cooler vintage you know and luigi your thoughts on 16 um, you know, I think 16 was uh, kind of like overall was yeah. like a kind of classic style of vintage, you know, as Stefano mentioned. China. Well, like when, when it's like 03, 17, they're super warm. Well, you actually have um, more body to the wine, more structure. I think like 16 was, uh, I really, I picked the 16 because I think it's very elegant in my opinion. As the 18, too. All the herbal quality come out in the... Yeah. Like for like uh, 17, of course, it was very, very good. Um, but according to my palate, it's, I mean, it's, it's just me. I think 16 was uh, a better vintage for my tasting, of course. Excellent. I think what I'd like to draw everybody's attention to is this slide. This is kind of, we've talked all about these things, but I think again, when we look at Moscato di Asti, kind of maybe before this thing, it is just, you know, fun, fizzy, fruit wine. This, again, hopefully we're learning and tasting these differences on the seriousness of it, but the historical aspect, and the other thing, this is, I mean, I don't know if you're a science nerd like I am, but the wine is the progenitor, meaning it is, it, it has birthed all the other Moscato, everything that you know uh, after, for the most part, is related to it. It, it, is, a, it is, a, is a varietal that can mutate very fast. It also has a lot of synonyms, so it can be very, very, very uh, confusing. Obviously, the local synonym, synonym is uh, Moscato Canelli, but like in France, it's uh, Muscat uh, Blanc a, a, a Pit Grand. Um, but I think, at least for my, for my flavor and my taste, and I think nostalgia-wise, the expression that happens in in uh, in the in Moscato di Asti is super unique and beautiful, where you get this flowers, white page, apricot and sage. The one thing that we haven't talked about, and I'm curious in, in my reading, is do you feel that the the primary soil that Moscato Bianco enjoys the most is kind of that decomposed marine, you know, fossils like the limestone? Is is that is that where you find the best expression, or 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 is it a multitude of different terroir? And this is for all the producers. Well, in my case, I, I really agree on the white uh, soil reach of, um, of limestone. That's the best, especially now because we grant some acidity. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't do too many experiments on Moscato on more like richer soils. I would stay on this. We can do, we have exceptions, there are always exceptions, but I think it grows very nicely, especially now that we have such a rich sugar content, the, 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 the soil you mentioned helps the balance that we are all looking for. Anyone else, Stefano or, or uh, Marco, any thoughts on, on the, the soil itself? <laughs> Uh, vabbè, sì, per quanto, uh, per quanto mi riguarda, uh, noi siamo, abbiamo vigneti principalmente uh, calcarei, uh, tolto con qualche vena sabbiosa, uh, tolto una vigna che è da dove produciamo un single vineyard, che è la Gareisa, che quello è proprio solo e esclusivamente sabbia. 
ma the main production comes from limestone soils while they have a crew vineyard that it's on sandy marine deposits so it's really rich in terms of uh, uh, marine connections and it's more sandy than the usual that's that's super interesting and if you haven't tried the the single vineyard one it is it is very very interesting another another question for the group that i think a lot of people ask and we've talked about it a lot um in that that you drink it super fresh are there examples of of, of aging moscato diasti and, and what are what are the thoughts on that i think we're learning i think we are getting more confident of how good it ages like for me, for example, 2016 was when I realized how good it is. And we are systematically taking some bottles of Scrapona for tasting it later. But we can go more uh, further than that. We can go more in the past. Even 10 years old, the uh, Moscato tastes very, very good. And it becomes a different wine. I think different pairings as well. Like with cheese, I think a six or seven year old Moscato Dusty is fantastic. And also here, there are a few of us producers that started earlier and now we are all realizing how good, how important it is to keep some uh, old bottles of Moscato Dusty because it's surprising how good it ages. And, uh, and I think it's also important to mention that as, an, as a designation, we must indicate the vintage, which is not a given in all the sweet wines or spumante wines, but Moscato Dusty is vintage. So that is a, a, um, a consideration that is a mandatory if we want to talk about old, old vintages. And Moscato Dusty always has a vintage on the label. And so we can, do, we can play with old vintages. I think that's a fantastic point. And I, I, think, I think, Andrea, that leads us into, into, into you uh, specifically. So everyone, Andrea is from Marenko. So this is the, hopefully you can see this is the wine that we'll be trying now. This is the Strevi 2019. Uh, and I don't know if you know, Andrea, but in 2006, uh, your, your family's estate was the very first um, Moscato di Asti producer I'd ever visited before. I was with a, with a group of uh, Americans with uh, Brian Larkey back in the day. Fantastic. Thank you. I didn't know. So that, that's great. Great to know. I wait you. I wait you again. <laughs> I have a bottle of the Grappa Riesling down in my, my, uh, my basement. I wait for you. I wait for you back because I wasn't there. I was doing something else in 2006. <laughs> I'm just going to speak about a bit more of the territory. I'm going to go back in the slides so we can kind of see the place as a whole. But, you know, the region has, has uh, recently become uh, a World Heritage Site. And uh, you're going to speak on, on, on the UNESCO and then, and, then, and then beyond that. Yeah, I think uh, UNESCO is, uh, I don't know they say in English, but in Italian we say la ciliegina sulla torta, like the cherry on the cake. I mean, it's, a, it's the result of what Luigi started to say one hour ago and what Marco was telling about with the winemaking. So that is the result of, uh, of a long history. And uh, it's nice to, I, I did some study, some research for, for, for talking to, about this. And it's, if you go to on the UNESCO site, I, I will share it on the chat, and you read the words that uh, UNESCO uses to, to describe why they gave Piemonte this uh, recognition. It's very nice because it, it talks about the beauty of the hills, the beauty of the vineyards, but most of all it talks what they want to protect is the connection between the territory and the man, what the, what the human being, what the, the people have done in Piemonte and what the people are doing in Piemonte. So, and I think this is the magic of uh, Moscato, Moscato d'Asti and the other wines of Piemonte. It's a mosaic. It's a, you can, you can uh, if you go to the Lange, you see hills that share the uh, grapes of Barolo and grapes of Moscato. If you come to Strevi, to Strevi you see uh, Moscato and you see the Brachetto for Brachetto d'Acqui. We have vineyards in Fontanina and you see Moscato and Barbera d'Asti, but you always see Moscato d'Asti and uh, it's, uh, the wineries are always proud about their Moscato vineyards. So I think the, 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 um, we had a very interesting question two years ago when we did the masterclass and I think it was from Lean Farmer. Why, why so many grapes? And, uh, but this is the beauty. I mean, there are no, I don't see other regions that work with so many varieties but they always, but we, in Piemonte, every variety has a reason to exist. And so I think this is one of the beauties that make uh, Piemonte different. And the, I think it's not by chance that uh, it was the first uh, territory 
to be declared the uh, UNESCO World Heritage in uh, 2014, um, it was. And of course, Moscato being, Moscato Dusty being one of the most planted grapes, uh, it is, uh, it plays an important role in the, in the UNESCO story. But again, I think it's about the people. We have uh, personalities, um, the Savoy that Luigi mentioned and uh, Croce, his winemaker, they, they stopped the fermentation for the first time. They, they found out how good it is if you keep it sweet because the terpenes that Stefano talked about express better if you don't ferment completely because otherwise the secondary fermentation, the secondary aromas would uh, cover a little bit the terpenes. So they did it and it was the 17th century. So it was a long time ago. Then Gancha and Canelli made the autoclaves with the Martinotti with his winemaker. And then we go to more recent times, families like the families we have here today, like Togliotti and all the five families have played a role in uh, the 2014 uh, recognition. We talked about, uh, I see also it on the chat, the, the, the role of Michele Chiarlo and the Chiarlo uh, of uh, introducing the Moscato dust in the States. Uh, they, they were pioneers and we have to thank them for what they did. And the story is continuing. So I think that's why I say the, the, it's the cherry on the cake that the UNESCO um, recognition in 2014. And uh, I think it's twice important because it's a sweet wine. So if we think about sweet wines, we don't always think about territories. It's only when it's an important sweet wine. So we can think about Sauterne, we can think about Tokai, Marsala. It's always uh, important territories that make an important wine. And for sweet wines, it's not uh, a given. It, it happens when the wine is very, very important. And I, I mean, I just love that. And just to reiterate, you know, some of those historical, historical points that you mentioned, like Croce. So to give everyone context and the date, if you don't know Croce, Croce was a, was a, a landowner and a winemaker in the, in the 1600s. So in 1606, he wrote basically about how to make Moscato di Asti in 1606 and how he, he, he stopped fermentation and then he filtered it. And, and all the people from the land came over and he was like, stop bothering me. And he wrote it down and just, he gave it to people. And then 1865 is Carlo Gancia. So this is an area, and this is why, you know, I'm very passionate about Piemonte. Um, it's one of the, the, the places where, you know, so much history, specifically for wine, that, you know, it has is, it is turned the world upside down with what all of you have done, all your families. And then to add one more name to the modern uh, list, because I know the, the Palazzo where the, the Consorzio is located, is named Ratti, after Renato Ratti. And we all know him if in, in the wine world as making the, the first map of Barolo, but I think a lot of people don't know how pivotal he was also in the role of Moscato di Asti, and um, in, in Asti in general. And I, I think, um, you know, tasting today and, and having these wines in contact mm -hmm. has really, even for myself, pushed me to kind of get out of my own box and, and see the potential. Um, Andre, can you speak specifically to your wine, the... the, the and, Carabona, yeah, thank you. And, and from each of these wines, that's the beauty of today is each one is singular and, and pointed, and I, I love that. Yeah, th th thank you. This, this is, uh, and, uh, I know it, it has been said, but I think uh, um, a big thanks goes to the consortium that, and, and to us a little bit and to the association and to you guys that moderate these things because it's the fourth year we do this and it's, also for us, I think we are part of the innovation because uh, having uh, five Moscato Dusty from the same vintage on the same table is something new and it's very nice for us as well. And today we have the 19, which was a very good vintage and I'm representing uh, a border area of Moscato Dusty, but just in terms of geography because uh, Strevi, uh, the, the town where my winery is, uh, is. Uh, one of the most traditional, uh, like all the others, like uh, Moncalvina and uh, Scavino, all the, the places that the, the consortia speak are very, have an um, important role in the Moscato d'Asti. So my winery is called Marenko, named after my family. It was my uh, great grandfather who started and he started in this vineyard, the Scrapona. So since uh, 19, 85, we, st we decided that this vineyard uh, wants, uh, deserves, deserves a wine. 
Um, Strevi is uh, southeast of the Appalachian, is a little bit uh, warmer, um, more, more uh, like light, light hills, than, less steep than Santo Stefano or some, something like that. Uh, very close to the mountains, so the, um, we have a natural refrigerator, air cooler that refrigerates the, the grapes. And, and so the, the Moscato from Strevi is, is uh, very characteristic. And uh, the Scrapona is uh, from this single vineyard, and we like it to keep it separate because we believe that the aromas of the Scrapona are very unique. Um, it has the classic aromas of Moscato, and sometimes it goes tropical, like passion fruit and, and more tropical. And then a very full, uh, full mouth. Um, Five percent alcohol, but very, very full and uh, and nice. And yes, it can age. This is very, very nice. We can. Uh, I hope we can. Uh, we can try together when you come next time. You're all invited. We can try some old vintages at the at the winery. I definitely look forward to that. Um, these are all. Everybody should have their 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 tasting notes. I'm going to take off this because I want to see people's faces. Um, there we go. This is more fun. It's like the Brady Bunch. <laughs> Anna, do you, do you, are, are there any questions? Yeah, there was actually a few that I was actually waiting for the end to go ahead and mention. Um, so Marissa Davari was asking, what is the range of residual sugar among all the Moscato wines in general? Mm, I start because I was talking, mine is 130 grams. 130. And one, <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, it depends on vintages, but yeah, it should be around one between 120 and 130. Yes, uh, Jean Pierre is saying from uh, 90 to 120. Okay. How many people are having a hard time um, spinning? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so a lot of hands go up. It's noon. Uh, any other questions, Anna? Yes, Lynn would like to know if there are many independent growers in Piedmont or is most of the Moscato d'Asti estate wine? Well, that's about the territory. So there, there are independent growers. Moscato d'Asti is a big appellation and during uh, history, we created a balance of uh, growers, uh, transformers. I don't know how to say that, yeah. Uh, sellers that uh, buy the grapes and uh, make the wine and uh, um, integrated family wineries like we are. Diciamo che ultimamente c'è anche la col fatto di questi imbottigliamenti che vanno per le cantine ci sono molte aziende piccole che riescono a prodursi in sé il moscato. With technological improvements it's a lot easier now for those who were just wine growers now who have the chance to bottle their own production. There are some easy, there's an easy way using, uh, using bottling machines that can, move, can be moved from, from one winery to another that everyone can also bottle its own production. So it is a great chance for those who feel that they have, uh, they can promote their crew or their sorry, or they can promote their specific vineyard in a specific way by bottling it, that there's a great chance right now for them. So I, I want to pose this to the group. So this is a, it's a unique opportunity to have, you know, five producers here. We've all been separated. This is kind of how we create community today in the world. Who would like to personally put it on speaker view, share their Moscato di Asti story? Because I, I don't think we talk to the producers enough in this regards of how, how the wines can be, sorry, I have a delivery, um, formative in, in the way we, we, uh, we do wine. So let, I'll be right back. You guys, uh, you guys, some, someone please, because I really think you have the producers here. It's, we need to share our, our, our view and our passion with them. Uh, this is like, thank you very much, all of you, for doing what you do, because it inspires us. So raise your hand, tell your story. Okay, go ahead, Julia. Hey, um, I'm sorry, I'm at, I'm at the wine store, so it's kind of nuts. I remember going in 2018 to the region and actually what uh, shocked me was the way the slopes, the how the slopes are really steep. And I think because what we get in the U.S. as a representation sometimes of what we know, 
is just not the, the, the breadth of what it is. And also what the food pairings, because I want to say it's that truffle egg pasta, that Tarjani, it's a dish that they put, um, we, they always paired it with the result, I mean, with the uh, Moscato and it was just beautiful. So for me, it was the, the foods of the region with the Moscato and how elegant it was, the, the wines are. Thank you. Vincent had a question or a comment. Vincent. Hi, yes. Um, hey, uh, so happy to be here. Hey, everyone. Uh, thank you, everyone that's uh, been presenting. This has been amazing learning about all of this. Um, to just give like a quick story. Uh, I've been in the wine industry now for seven years. Uh, and in 2012 was really like the first time that I ever had wine in general. Um, before that, um, it was just like beer, or liquor, or whatever. And my first impression, um, my mom, she had it was uh, Lodali. Um, I'm not sure if it's, it's like a, probably like 12, 13 bucks, uh, but it was a Moscato Dasti. And, um, you know, it was really sweet and it was fruity and, you know, very like grape tasting. And I was like, wow, this is, this is really interesting. So, you know, so it like planted a seed. And then a year later, I ended up working in the wine industry and it was part of my like start to evolution to like, getting into other types of wines. So I just want to appreciate you guys for making wines. That's like kind of like the gateway for people to have access to know like, hey, this is one style of wine. And then, you know, you can progress into either other things or you can enjoy all these different nuances here today because I had no idea that there were so many different eclectic styles. So this was great. Awesome. Thank you Thank for you. sharing. Yes, I think I know everybody's pressed for time and busy. I, I uh, is it one more story. Does anybody else want to give their, uh, their moment to our, our friends in Osti, sharing, caring. Sharing is caring, as my six-year-old says to me. Um, there was a question, if you give me just one second, maybe it's curious to know that there was a, someone asking why Santa Vittoria d'Alba is part of the, the appellation, although being so detached by the, the main area. And we've done a little bit of homework, hopefully we did not go wrong, but it was part of the uh, Campari Cinsano estate, Part of the winery was, especially the winemaking process was uh, was taking place there. So it, it is detached because part of the Cinzano estate was over there. Although the vineyards were mainly in the area of production that, as we know it now. So today we focused on Moscato di Asti, and I can't thank um, all of y'all enough for taking the time out of your day to taste, to listen, to ask questions to the producers. Thank you all so much every day. I get to see your faces is, is inspiring. I miss you so much. Uh, mm -hmm. Please let us come to Italy soon, for the love of God. Um, Jeff. I need to leave. Jeff, <laughs> Jeff, Jeff can, can I use the time for a uh, technical information? Absolutely. Uh, it's the, it's the, you are the first to see the new label. So for those who know the Scrapona already, the wine is not changing. It's just the label restyling. So. Don't worry, the wine is the same, but we have a little bit restyled the label. And, okay. and it's the you are the first people to see it today in the US, but it's arriving. Everybody, nice. <laughs> thank you. I wanted to take the time to say thank you to everybody for being here. A special thank you to Giacomo and to all the producers and Jeff for doing this. If anybody would like the PowerPoint, please feel free to email us or to write in the chat. We'd be happy to share it with anybody. And again, thank you all. But don't leave just yet. We have one teaser. So Giacomo and I were talking about this. So Giacomo, if you want to speak briefly and, and, and tease out, maybe it can be a session in the future about yeah. the new changes to, to other parts of the, the Asti Appalachian. Yeah, the consortium is uh, embracing a few changes of the code of production. So in the future, we're going to have some other styles of wine also with less, less sugar residuals. So it's going to be a chance maybe in the near future to taste other styles of, uh, of Moscato. So hopefully I'm going to see you soon again on these screens. So please go out. You are all now uh, anointed ambassadors, lovers. I knew everybody already loved it already. I mean, that's why we're all here. This is like, it is the gateway drug, but you keep taking it no matter what, because anytime I need to make my wife happy, I just pull one of these out and there's a smile on her face. And, uh, you know, thank you all very, very much. Thank you to IEEM. Thank you to all the producers, the consortio. Um, I hope that we can all do this in person again one day, but this is, uh, this is a great way to see everybody. 
And um, as they say in Texas, mille grazie. Thank you. And remember, that that. you can all find the wines at your local stores. They're all very easily accessible. Thank you. Grazie a tutti. Thank you. Thank you to everybody.